just getting used to this thing. I haven't worn it before, and my glasses got well, a bit strange, so apologies for that. I'll get used to it in the next few minutes. Um, we're going to have a communion service this morning, but it's not going to be at the Rod of Communion. It's going to be further on down the, uh, down the road, as I said, and we'll find out why as we, we go through. Um, it is good to be here, isn't it? We're yeah, here at Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, there may be a few of us, because I'm missing, uh, because of sickness. And that's another reason, isn't it, why we need to pray every morning for each other. We need to pray for our church, our, our fellowship. Morning, good to see you. Happy New Year. And, um, yeah, that's why we need to hold each other up in prayer and, and pray for the full arm to be on to each and every one of us. And without that, the church can come under attack. So it is important for us to keep praying. Morning, good to see you. Don't worry. Right, good. So, first of all, notices. Um, well, first of all, Jesus is Lord. Obviously, that's the best notice in the planet, isn't it? Right. It's also the 250th anniversary today of Amazing Grace. And we're not going to sing it, but the point is just having it thought. And there was, an, there was a really good program, we only got part of this morning on the radio about it. And uh, yeah, that's amazing. 250 years later, this song is still being sung. And it's all because of one man finding God's grace in his life. You know? And that's for each of us here, isn't it? But we can look back on our lives even in last year, and see things that we're making ashamed of. But you know, if we love Jesus, if really by faith we look to him, then forgiveness comes. And that's amazing grace. So that was a nice to remember of him. Um, the Bible and prayer time this Wednesday, the last one we had was awesome. Not because I took the Bible study, but because we had an evening of testimony. We had prayer and praise. And Shanae and I went home Really excited, didn't we? We were talking about it in the car, we were talking about it the next day. The testimony that everybody there, everybody shared a testimony. And it's always nice to have that because you learn about people things that you never knew. But also gave glory to God. And I tell you, those who work there, I'm sorry to say, you really miss something special. Really special. Because I believe testimony are oh, so powerful. So thank you for those who came and shared the testimony. It's all not always easy sometimes. Well, actually, Jesus deserves it, doesn't he? You know? So we get over these things. Good. So, uh, as I said, we're going to do the um, uh, communion in a minute. Before that, I've got something I'd like to read to you, then we're going to sing. But I've discovered this little booklet last year, and this is a really special booklet. It's by J.C. Rolls, and it's called A Call to Prayer. If you have problems praying, and when I talk about praying, People say, well, well, I pray all the time. Well, what are your prayers? Oh, Lord, help me today to be cast on God. Help me for God. Please help me. No, no, no. Those prayers are okay. God asks us to pray this prayer. But our prayers should be around Jesus. should be about the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this little book here is the best book I've ever read, read on prayer. And I've got tons of books on prayer. And if I could only have one, and I'm saying, if you want to buy one, you get the Banner of Truth online. If someone's really desperate to get it, I've got a spare one in my bag, you're more than welcome to it. It is life challenging. Life challenging. So I'm going to read one little bit of it first before we pray this morning. Look through the lives of the brightest and best of God's servants, whether in the Bible or not. See what is written of Moses and David and Daniel and Paul. Mark what is recorded of Luther and Bradford and Reformers. Observe what is related of the private devotions of Whitfield and others, and McShane. Tell me of one of all the goodly fellowship of saints and martyrs who has not had this mark most prominently. He was a person of prayer. Depend upon him. Prayer is power. Prayer obtains fresh and continued outpourings of the Spirit. He alone begins the work of grace in the man's heart. He alone can carry it forward and make it prosper. For the good spirit loves to be entreated, and those who ask most will have most of his influence. Prayer is the surest remedy against the devil and besetting sins. That sin will never stand firm, which is hard to be prayed against. That devil will never keep long dominion over us, which we beseech the Lord to cast forth. But then we must spread out all our case before our heavenly physician. If he is to give us daily relief, 
Do you wish to grow in grace and be a developing Christian? Be very sure if you wish it. You could not have a more important question than this. Do you pray? And I would really recommend this. If you're struggling in your prayer life, if you don't have a prayer life, or you think you do and not sure, I can't recommend it enough. Okay? So there is a spare one if anybody wants one, and uh, I wasn't going that way through. So Lord, we thank you now that as we come before you that we have the challenge of prayer. I love that word, call to prayer. And it's your call upon our lives, Lord. And Lord, whatever else we do, nobody can take our inner prayer life away from us. We may be put in a dungeon, we may be made blind or deaf or dumb, and yet, Lord, the inner spirit, your spirit, wells up with ours that we may pray. All else may be taken, but prayer never can be. Lord, let us have a heart to pray. Holy Spirit, challenge us to go to the deepest closets we've got, that our prayer life may change us, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you not only taught us how to pray, but you challenged us. You told us how to pray. I thank you that your word continues so much about prayer at times of want, of sickness, of other things. Lord, let us be a people that really look for those things and then stand on them. It is a challenge for us, Lord, and we can't do it in our flesh. But by the power of your spirit, this we can. So I thank you once again, Jesus, for making this all possible. And Lord, we do lift up to you those who are not here this morning because of sickness. We do pray for them, Lord. And Lord, I'd ask everybody in this room if they know a person by name who is ill from this fellowship, to lift them to you now in our hearts. That we lift their brothers and sisters to you, Lord, in earnest prayer. Lord, we don't want the ramblings of the flesh or men. We want the power of your spirit speaking to us. I thank you, Lord, that you sent your spirit. Father, I thank you. You sent your spirit through your son. That when Jesus, you went home, your work wasn't finished. You sent your spirit to complete it here on earth. And I thank you for that. Because otherwise we would be lost. And Lord, we pray for the other fellowships around here. That this new year will be a year of change for them and for us. That suddenly your people, your earnest people, would come together with great joy. And others would see it and wonder what is it. And we can share. Bring the boldness to each of us, Lord, this year. I thank you, Lord, for the challenge of that in our lives. And I thank you we don't do it alone. You do it through us. But also, we encourage one another. I thank you for testimony, Lord. I thank you for the joy of hearing testimony. I thank you for the way it uplifts our spirit and there is rejoicing in heaven. And Lord, I thank you that all we believe on is based upon you what you've told us and what you've done with us. And Lord, I could stand and pray for 50 other things at the moment, but Lord, we want to pray for things of the Spirit. Would you guide us to pray? And we do pray for our world. We do pray for our neighbours. We do pray for our friends and those around us. But first and foremost, Lord, we want to praise you and give you the glory. And then ask for you to guide us in our prayers. So Lord, as we release this time to you now, Lord, bring your word to each of our hearts, Lord. Let it encourage each of us. Let each of us this day be here, encouraged. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of each other and for the blessing of that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, you. Right, Nick's going to sing the first song. During that, we're going to have a collection. Uh, the song is Lord for the Years. I'm going to take the collection during that. Thank you. So, who's doing the collection? Wait for the. Thank you, Paul. I like the smile of men.
stroke in, you might have seen a sign out there saying New You, no, New Year, New You, okay? And lots of people make resolutions this time of year. And have you ever wondered where the New Year resolutions come from? You know, um, it's not a surprise, we'll be fine to find out where it came from, and I'll show you that in a moment. But let me look at this about the 17th century. In the 17th century, New Year's resolutions were so common that folks found humour in the idea of making and breaking them. A Boston newspaper from 1813 featured the first recorded use of the phrase New Year's resolution. It said, and yet I believe there are multitudes of people accustomed to receive injunctions of New Year resolutions who will sin all the month of December and with a serious determination of beginning the new year, with new resolutions and new behaviour, and with a full belief that they shall thus expiate and wipe away all their former faults. And it's been said this century, it suggests that today's resolutions are also a reflection of status, financial wealth, responsibility and self-discipline, which isn't that different from how the new year's resolutions were done in the past. But originally, the origin from the Babylonians. What a surprise. What a surprise. The origin of making New Year's resolutions rests with the Babylonians who reportedly made promises to their gods in the hope that they were good favour in the New Year. So, what is the difference between a Christian and somebody who makes New Year's resolutions in that sense? There is a huge difference. You see, what is your hope based upon as we start this New Year? And this is what God challenged me with weeks and weeks ago in the last preaching. And as I've told you before, I don't set a sermon up and preach to you and tell you what to do. That's the first thing in my heart. I go in my closet, as John Wesley said he did, and I seek what God wants to teach me. And when he challenges me over and teaches me, sometimes I share it with you guys. And that's what, to me, preaching is about. It's bringing Jesus to the forefront and hearing what he's got to say. And this morning, the challenge was, what is your hope based upon as we start this new year? Is it the Babylonian hope, false hopes, self-discipline, gods of this world, or is it the hope in the truth? You see, the world's hope is different to what God's hope is. The world's hope is one of, well, I hope this happens. Yeah, I hope when I go to the gym, I'm going to lose this. That's in the deepness of your heart. Most people's New Year's resolutions fail. Why? Because they're depending on themselves to do it, or another man or woman to do it for them. That's a false hope in the world of Christians. If, if you're a Christian and that's the way you place your life, you may be wondering why your Christian life isn't as dynamic as others. That's the answer. So, what is your hope? And that's what I'm going to share today. What is our hope? 2 Thessalonians 2 16 17. You don't have to turn to this, I'll admit to you. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And God, even our Father, which has loved us, and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good work and word. Consolation means encouragement with the alleviation of grief. Have you ever thought of that? This is what God's promising you in His grace. Encouragement with the alleviation of grief. You must have rest that. It's really impossible. Well, it's not impossible. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Really, it's so <coughs> impossible. And yet, we've wasted our whole lives. The next thing is the word hope. And it's wonderful. In the New Testament, it's used completely. Wherever you've got the word hope in the New Testament, it means the same thing. It's a favourable and confident expectation. Not the worldly hope of, well, oh, I hope we'll do this, it might work. I hope I'm in the pool because then I can have the house I want to go and sort this problem out. That's a false hope. But this hope is a favourable and confident expectation. So what are we confident in? What are we expecting? And that's what I'm going to do. Before we take the communion, I'm going to lay some ground down here. And I know many of you will know this and you'll say, well, actually, this is old ground here. But the reason I say this is sometimes we get comfortable in life. And we forget the early things. Yeah? And when I was a diver, um, I was trained as a diver, and you know, there were a lot of divers all over the place. 
One day, years and years into diving, you know, bear in mind, I'm diving in really bad conditions, good conditions, you know, all sorts of things. And it's, it's something the club said, should we go and do that first test we ever had when we were in the club? It was called the A test. And in those days, the A test was only had no diving equipment, except one part we got away from. Do you know the most of this table? We'd forgotten the basics, yet we were good divers. You see what I'm saying? And it's good for us sometimes to go over the basis a bit. Because actually, if all we remember is the basis, we're on a good road. You can have all the theology you want, but if you haven't got that basis, if you're not living that basis, you'll be losing out. And you might even be in the end of heaven. Jesus says, I don't know you. Because you've been basing your life on theology rather than your easy, childlike truth. So, we're going to just run through some of this. And I don't apologise for it, because I think this is so important. Everything in this Bible, sorry, everything in this Bible, absolutely everything, leads us to Jesus, leads us to Christ. Everything. This is why it's here. I don't know if you've thought of that. Have you ever thought, why is my Bible here? It's not just telling you what to do and what to do. It's showing you everything about Jesus, what's going to happen, what did happen, what will happen. In Genesis 1 1, it says a simple thing in the beginning, God. That word God is talking about the Trinity. It's a human plural noun. It means more than one. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the first verse in the Bible. The last verse in Revelation 22 20 and 21, two verses, says this Surely I come quickly. Amen. That's Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The last two verses are verses of a promise and a blessing. Isn't that exciting? That's why if you've never read from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 there, go home and start reading it. Because we need all these things. We need to know them. Otherwise it wouldn't have been written. And I've said this before. Even the names in here, sometimes you might say, well, actually, why do I have to know about Fred Fox? It's not Fred Fox, but I'll just say that. So really. Well, one day, Sinead, when I first went to Sinead, we were praying, weren't we? We had this thing about this word, and I said, well, we'll just get a name and see what it means. Oh, I'm so excited. We ended up with you, David, didn't we? Because it turned out, this is a guy with a great list of people, which you must, when you get to this, oh, and we picked out one of them, not knowing. We ended up going looking at grandparents. We were looking at lineage. We found King David knew the family line. This was awesome. See, the Holy Spirit can't wait to treat you with excitement for going to the world. And it happens, it blesses you. So, be encouraged. Surely I come quickly to prove this philosophy. This same Jesus became flesh. We just had Christmas. We were talking about baby. Have you ever thought about the embryo? Have you ever thought about the embryo? Jesus was an embryo in Mary's womb. That says a thing about abortion, doesn't it? The mother's womb had Jesus in it, an embryo. Then he becomes a baby. Then he becomes a boy. Then a teenager. Then a man. You know? This is where it says in John 1 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. These are things we need to reflect on. There's a really angry world out there. And it's angry because of God. Have you ever thought about that? There's no other reason it's angry. It's angry because of God, challenging this world, who created it. So I will challenge you, and this is what challenged me months ago when I've been doing this. This is taking out of the God time script. This is what I want to say to you. Do you have hope in him and his work? Do you have hope in him and his work? That's the message that I will bring to you for the 1st of January 2023, so that when we go into this, we go into it with that hope and that belief. The blood and the resurrection. Now we're going to move to Matthew 27, if you'd like to turn to Matthew. This is going to be our readings as well. We're going to use Matthew. And after the communion, we'll go back to Matthew as well, okay? Matthew 27. Matthew 27. I've called this the blood and the resurrection. So we've had the embryo, the baby, all that, showing God's love for us. 
in sending this very delicate child into the world and turning into a man who then went and did this for us. The blood on the cross, Matthew 27, 26b, maybe this last half of the verse, 26b to 50. I'm going to read the whole thing. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put him on a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, How, King of the Jews, this is how much of the world hates God. And they stood upon him and took the ring and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And then when they come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gold. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then, were the two, two thieves crucified him, one on the right and one on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocked him, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified him passed the same in his tomb. Now, from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, that must have acted on him. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calls for Elijah. And straight away one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. This is why I'm doing this before for you. I want to show you this day with a real, real deep understanding of why we're doing it for you. Is to remember all this that Jesus did for us. And then we have that wonderful bit. This is where we can shout and shout and scream with joy. His resurrection victory. Matthew 28, 1 to 7. Matthew 28, 1 to 7. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not, for I know that we seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Behold, I have told you. In other words, that angel says to the Lord, and says to everyone who is in this room and the world outside, it is now your responsibility. Jesus has done it. You women, go and tell the others. Go and tell the world. It's your responsibility. Get on with it. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? But that is for us as well. So, again, I'd say to us and say to you, do you have hope in him? That is a challenge for everyone. Do you have hope in him and his word? 
And then, the next session I'm going to speak on is the hope of new life in this victory over sin and death. The hope of new life. Now, if you've been coming to Romans, the studies, you'll have read and studied together of that incredible hope that we have and what Jesus has done and fulfilled that for us. But the simple statement of facts, I believe, is found in John 3, 16 to 18. John 3, 16 to 18. John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth or to put trust in him should not perish, but have everlasting life forever. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you have hope in him and his work? You know, that is the key. What is your hope in him and his work? Is it the hope of the world, which is tempted, well, you know, it might be, might not. Or is it a firm, solid, I have hope in Jesus? Doesn't move. As the Old Testament writers wrote that word time and time again. So, we're going to go back to the bread and the wine. We're going to take communion. And we've had a moment of prayer. <coughs> the thing is, we need to reflect on why it is we take this communion together. And that is it. We've just gone through it. It's remembrance. And the reason we have this remembrance is so that we, you and I do not walk out of here and just go our separate ways and forget everything until the next time we come to do it. This is a place of holiness. God's Word is a place of holiness. When we're full of the Spirit and read His Word, we're in a place of holiness. Like Moses, when he had to take his shoes off before the bush. It's a place of holiness. Do you read your Word as a place of holiness? Do you take your shoes off and ask God to speak to you through the Spirit and what His Word wants you to know? That is the challenge for us as Christians. Because then His Spirit wells up in us. We become Christ-like, which is what's promised. And the world sees the reflection of Jesus in us. You may say, well, I'm not good enough for that yet. We're all on a journey. You might be a new Christian. Doesn't mean you can't reflect Jesus. You might be an old Christian. You still can't say you can't reflect Jesus. That is why we're here. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're here to do his will on earth as in heaven. Okay. And you might think, this is quite a lot for us. But this is January the 1st. This is the start for us of a new year. We've got the rest in mind. So let's go back to the bread and wine as we check ourselves as we enter this holy communion with Jesus. So he is our Lord, our Saviour, our Redeemer, and our way to heaven. To have hope in Him and His Word is to have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one is. Matthew 26, 20 to 25. Go back to 26. 20 to 25 says this Now when the evening came Please put it there Now when the evening came he sat down in the floor and as they did eat he said Verily I say unto you Look one of you shall betray me And that's challenging words for us aren't they? People put too much emphasis just on Judas You know I have to reflect Will I betray you? Peter betrayed us. If we can't ask ourselves that question, are we living a full son? Because I can ask myself that question. And I can give a resounding, no, I do not want to let you down ever again, Lord. Because I know your spirit lives in me. I know I choose whether to sin or not. Because that's what Paul promises in his words to the Romans. Then Judas, which betrayed me, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. That is the key. Jesus knows our hearts. And his heart is that we would come in fellowship. Have you ever wondered what would happen if Jesus had said, Sorry, Lord, I will not repent. I've done a terrible thing. I've sold you out. Because that could have happened, couldn't it? But Judas was of a heart, like Pharaoh. He time and again said, 
Oh yes, I'm doing what your God said, Moses. And immediately he went off again and did what God said. Because his heart was rotten. He never had that desire to be close to Jesus. His Pharaoh never had a heart's desire to be close to God. But I'm sure I speak for everybody here today that we're not of those people because we're here. We may be stumbling a bit, bumbling a bit, but that's why we need to go over this again to help us not to stumble, not to stumble. So, what I'd like to do now is to take our communion. So, we partake in this time to keep fresh in our memories of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Father's love, enabling the power of the Spirit. We come with expectant hearts to have our faith increased, a blessing on holy ground, and our hope in you by grace. So Lord, before we just take the bread and do the wine, we just want to lay a few moments before you so that each of us can come before you and get ourselves right. If there is anything wrong in our life, that we want to get sorted before we take this together. And I thank you, Jesus, that you've made it so easy for us. We've just got to have an honest heart and be honest with you. And the rest just happens by the power of the Spirit. And the devil must flee, as we read earlier. So Lord, I thank you now. So, let's come down with the bread and the wine, those who have come and served for me, that'd be lovely. Um, we're going to read Matthew 26, 26, and then we're going to give out the bread. Um, and you know, this is so exciting. Our hope is in Him by grace. It's His grace that's given us this. We've got struggles with it. we just got to be honest about it. And that's the discoveries I have made in my Christian walk. Is the more I struggle to do so, the more I fight it, the more I say I'm not going to. The moment I broke down in prayer, release it to me, trusting by faith that his word is true. And reading the scriptures that are open to my situation, the spirit comes in, brings it on. So Lord, we thank you now that we've got this bread to remind us. So Lord, as it says here in Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body.
took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them. And if you could hold on to it, we'll bring this together and I'll read the last bit of that scripture just we're about to take it together. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And then Jesus made an incredible promise. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What a wonderful promise. I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then, in preparation for Nick to sing and for to join me, he says, it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So we're going to sing this hymn now. And the first hymn we're going to sing is, This is the air I breathe, and then we're going to go into There is Hope. That wonderful hope that we'll be speaking of. Thank you, Nick.
That's a promise to us as a church. And then finally, Matthew 28, 20. Matthew 28, 20. Says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of this world. In fact, the end of this world actually means the end of this messianic age. So Jesus has promised to be with us as a fellowship, as a group of people, as a group of believers, to the end of the messianic age. And then we're going to be with him for eternity. And that is why I believe that Paul and others do not dwell on heaven. Have you ever thought that? We read the, these scriptures. They don't dwell on it forever. What are they dwelling on? Christ's victory, and what does it mean for their lives today? All of Paul's writings is to encourage people to be living the life today. So when Christians go on about, I can't wait to get to heaven, I'm of a second coming, and I'm all for studying the second coming, because that's what Jesus tells us to do. Be aware of it. But he doesn't say dwell on it. We're not to dwell on heaven. We're not to dwell on this. And you might say, well, that's all. But no, it isn't. Because we're here for one reason. If you're sitting here and you're not dead, it's because God has decided you're worth something at this moment in time. I visit someone who's 97. He's worth every inch of his space he takes up on this planet. He encourages me. He prays for me. He blesses my ministry. And we also pray for him. Do you know, that's what I want you to go home with today. That you are so special, you haven't been called home yet. God's got something he wants you to do. And how can I base that on scripture? Because I always say, whenever he says it, always say it in scripture. So we're going to have a quick look at that to, to finish this section. But I want to end up at the end of Matthew in one But before that, we'll go back to 28 7, which is there, it says, Go. All right? Go quickly. Tell his disciples he's risen. I have told you, it's now your responsibility. And over the page of my Bible, anyway, on verse 8, it says this. And they departed. This is the women. Did they stand around saying, oh, 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 oh this is too much. I don't know. Did you see that? It looked terrible. No, they didn't. They took hold of what the angel said and they did it. Have you seen how these women are absolutely magnificent throughout the New Testament? Absolute madness. They put the men to shame. <coughs> Ladies, never be crying on God. Because God really is with us. Hi, is you alright? I love the visiting people. I know they're getting in already, but it looks like more will come in now because we were uh, excited about that. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring the disciples' word. Are we running to go and bring the word to others we know? I don't mean literal sense, because we've got to stop to talk to them, obviously. But technically, are we running? Are we fulfilling our responsibilities that God has put on us? I don't know what my responsibility is. Oh my goodness, please, go to your prayer place. Get hold of this, a call to prayer. Get on your knees. Realise you're in a holy place. And just say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Not, what can I do for you? Because that's not going to bring glory to God. If you're running around doing loads of things in your flesh, for God, you're not bringing glory to him, you're bringing glory to yourself because it's your idea. If you go to your prayer chamber, kneel down and say to the Lord, Lord, I'm here for one reason this day. I want to know what my calling is here. I want you to tell me what I'm to do this day. And he might say to you, I want you to go to your room, enjoy your husband, rest. Well, God doesn't talk to me like that. Well, perhaps you understand that I can't even pray for us. Because God does talk like that. I have a thing which I don't want to share, but I will. And it may seem strange to some of you, but I will share it because it's testimony. We came up here yesterday in the pouring Do you remember how it was raining? I don't It was absolutely coming down, cats and dogs. We had our dogs in the car when we come. Shalane was there. She had a new poster. And I didn't want to get it wet. And it's tea. We drove here in faith. We prayed for when we'd stop. Got the park next to the board. She may have got out of the box, went to the field, and she would tell you it didn't stop raining. Because I asked her when she got back, did it stop raining? She was drenched. Didn't it? I got out of the car. My coat, my big green coat, was as dry as anything because it stopped raining when I opened the door. But it didn't stop raining in the rest of this building. 
I went to the thing that you might say is mad, but it's so going out to buy it, even more mad things in there. I went to that place, I got the poster off, I cleaned the glass, come back, put the Velcro on, no rain. All around this rain. I get in the car, I prepare the new poster, it's not a five minute job because I've got Velcro and all this stuff. I come back, put it on, wipe the glass so it's all nice and clean, put it go back. I go back to the car, get the other poster, there's two posters there all on top of each other. Get that in there, that's the big one, which I really didn't want any more from. Get that in there. No rain. But it's pouring. Shut the door, turn the key, go back to the car, get out of the car to go and get Shalane, and it's pouring. My coat was drenched. Now, that's the God I love. You might say, well, why would he do that? Because he asked Shalane to do the poster for that out there. That's why. That's why. He was keeping what he wanted. And then those posters that got soaked in wet, they've been ruined. And because they were new year ones, we had to have them up before the last night. So it must be amazing. So be encouraged. I really want to encourage you. So there we go down the page here. So the women have run off and they've got great joy. Have you noticed it doesn't say great fear? It says with fear. That fear is a fear of the Lord. That's the fear we need to know. You know, when I was a little boy, I couldn't see my daddy. I was never ever terrified of my dad. Right? My mum was another thing. My mum, she just went, Michael, oh, I'm dead, man. You know? My mum was there. But my dad, he was a professional boxer, was a gentleman. But I also learned that he could be very strict discipline wise. So if I threw a stone and went through the window, which he did on several occasions, I'd be in trouble. I feared my dad there. But it wasn't a fear where I'd shriek in the corner because someone's beaten me in the past. It was a fear. Because who he was, the standing he had in my life. This is the fear we're talking about. A fear of the Lord, which is a good fear. Because it makes us remind ourselves that we're not in charge. We are the Almighty God. And then, in the morning, obviously, didn't like the cross, I just got very nice to see her. We pray for the Lord. Anyway, so that's it. And then a great joy. Have we got great joy? Yeah, but sometimes they might be weeping, they might be saying, but also we should have a great inner joy. And then verse 16 onwards is where I just want to end up on, down 16 to 20, to finish this book of Matthew. Then the 11 disciples, so Judas obviously isn't there, he's, he's the past master because of what he did, and there was a thing he paid for, went away to Galilee. Now, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So Jesus has arranged for them to go to Galilee. Do you know it's nearly seven days walk? If you're really good, you might do it for five. But it's almost seven days walk. It's like walking the Dorset Coast Guard. If you've never done that, go and walk that if you like walking from Jerusalem to go there. You know, that's 170 miles. So, they went all that way. Why couldn't Jesus have met in Jerusalem? Where they were. But no, they didn't question Jesus. They went. So they go to Galilee because he's asked them to. This is a challenge for us. Are we going where he's asking us to? And that going doesn't mean whizzing off halfway around the world. It's about coming before him asking him wants us to go. <laughs> so they get there. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Was Jesus too far away for them all to recognise him? Perhaps I don't know. Nobody really knows. I couldn't find any reason why. But actually, I, my heart was this: they've already doubted him in the upper room. These people have just been walking all that way. I don't know about you, but I've done walks of men and women, and people get despondent, don't they? I've got despondent. My feet are hurt. Am I really got to do this? That's how the enemy creeps into our life. He sows little seeds of despondency. So when they get there, my take on this would be that some of them were despondent. They just walked, perhaps they were walkers. How far does a fisherman walk? To his boat? I think he carries on sailing. Right? So perhaps that was the reason, but we don't know. But the point was some of them did that. Because they had become weak. The word actually, it means to waver. They wavered. Do you waver? 
do I want from? This is what I cry out to about, about being in the Spirit, by being in the Word, and being in prayer. If we're in prayer, then we don't waver. And if we do, we instantly see the proof of it. There's a book here which Josie Riles, in all these books, mentions time and time again. I, if I was on Desert Island Discs, and someone said to me, you get your Shakespeare, and you get your Bible, what other one book would you take? I would take this, Pilgrim's Progress, and I would take this edition, Victorian edition, the one with all the scriptures in it. And I would take this because this has got me out of the rut so many times in my life. I read it when I first became a Christian. This is the same version. I carry it with me. So why? Because in that book, who is Christian's partner throughout to the celestial gates? It's hopeful. Hope. It's what we've been talking about. And have you ever been in that place where you feel despondent, where you feel despair? In that book, there's the, there's the dungeon of despair. You know, the giant despair takes Christian and hopeful and falls in his place. They can't get out. They're going to die. Do you know, I really thank Bunyan for writing that. Bunyan must have had that moment so many times in his prison cell. Alone for years in a dark, dank dungeon while his wife and family perhaps didn't have food. He knew what it was. And what happens? Christian wants to give up. Hopeful says, no, there might be something here for us to get out. There might be a key. The key is meaning scripture. And they search on the floor of the dark, they find the scripture, which is the key, under a slab. Have you hidden your Bible under a slab that when you feel a bit flat, you don't go to? That's why I love that book. It's full of it. And I want to encourage you today. We need to help one another do these things. But more than anything, you need, I need my prayers. <coughs> That place where I can pray and then read the scriptures that the Lord's given me for my situation. And I have been in that place of despair. And I share that because, you know, look at uh, what's name's song, Newton's song. The great sinner. This was a man so foul, the other saviors thought he was the worst person for cussing on planet Earth. These are slave traders. He must have been pretty foul. And what he had done to those slaves would be awful. Yet, every time the devil came to him about that, about his past, he would go to the Word in prayer and be raised up with amazing grace. That is our heritage. That's what God has given us. So I want to build you up with this, give you that hope. So we then go on, and it says, um, and worshipped him. This indicates dropping to one's knees. Do you know? I've been in church, it's like this, I'm getting I'm going to drop to my knees sometimes when I'm singing or praying. But suddenly the devil says, oh, well, people might look at you and say, look, what's he doing? Or, or look, you're showing up. That's how the devil speaks to me sometimes. All right, being honest with you, because we're a family. And families can be honest with one another. But you know what I do? My view is, I ain't doing it for them. I'm not doing it for you, I'm doing it because the Lord has really put something in my heart where I just need to do it. But I belong to churches where people kneel just naturally. And it's not a problem there. Do we kneel enough? And I realize some might say, well, my knees are always good. Well, Jesus knows that. You can kneel in your heart, can't you? You know, let's not get religious about it. Let's, let's lighten up on these things. So, this means they knelt down in worship. They were in worshipful adoration. That's what that word means. Worshipful adoration. And Jesus... Now, Cain spoke to saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Do you know, this is so that you and I, as well as them, can know, moment by moment, day by day, Jesus is with us. And he's got all power. All power. Where? In heaven and in earth. If the devil's visiting you, you must be a pretty important person. All right? Because he can only be in one place at one time. Right? So if you're doing something so dynamic with like Steve Williams work here, you'd expect the devil perhaps to come see you personally. <laughs> a lot of the times it's our flesh that's the problem. Sometimes it is the spirit world that's in you. But whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If we're in prayer, it must flee, whatever it is. And if it's something we need to pray against, if it's a spirit world thing, then Jesus will tell us by his Holy Spirit. That's how it works. 
So we can depend on them, can't we? It says there we can depend on them, basically. And then it says that wonderful word, go. Ye therefore teach all nations. Go. This means go your way. It doesn't mean go off road more. When I first started work, I was 16 and I worked in a studio and I just got this job and my boss said to me, he had an artwork, he would have taken down the road to an agency called Charles Barker, the other end of the field street, uh, the other end of my bad field road. And before he had finished talking to me, I grabbed this bag, I was out the door, down ten flights of stairs, and I got the Charlie Barkers, and they were all laughing from reception. I said, what's wrong? I said, you didn't bring the right bag. You just grabbed the bag he had in his hand. I said, yeah. I said, go back. I went back, and Mr. Norton said, no, this wasn't for you. This paper is for you. It was a long black thing. You see the problem? Enthusiasm means you've got to jump out and go, no. We wait to listen to what the governor said. You know, it was the Holy Spirit, the Father speaking to us through him. So Jesus says, go. Go your way. Go thy way. Now, he then says, therefore, and teach all nations. Now, this teaching is important. It's a brisk command from Jesus. This is a command. This isn't like, go teach him in the gentle. Jesus says this as a command. So you and I have got something to do. We're to go our way, and we are therefore to go and teach, to disciple, to tell people about Jesus. That's what he's saying. Where you and I have got to go is between you and I and God. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Jackie Pullinger, a young girl, was told to go with a few bob on a, uh, a boat, across the seas, and she weren't sure where she was going. She knew God was guiding her by the Holy Spirit. The church said she shouldn't go. A young girl should not get on a boat with the only one of the she had, whatever it was, a girl. And she did, because she knew God had spoken to her. Look at Jackie Pullinger's ministry. Absolutely awesome. And I owe her a lot, because I had to work in drug units, and what I've learned from her from reading her books and seeing her and everything else, I apply it in my work with drugs. And we go through and pray for something, no cold turkey. Instantly delivered. Instantly delivered. Gets jobs, things like that. That's a reflection of that young girl being obedient. That thousands of others were taught by her in many ways. I want to encourage you. See what God wants you to do. And you will be so encouraged. And so will we see if you do it. To all nations, all right? That means community. That means a, a, a collective of people, if you like. Um, so it's not the whole of India. It could be just a part of India, a certain cultural group. So for us, it could be a cultural group in your village or in your town. Or God may send you across the planet somewhere else. I don't know. He certainly sent me some places. Uh, not my choosing, in my head. That's another thing. But he will equip you to do it. Because as soon as he does that, he promises to equip you with everything you will need. So he's not going to just send you a lead. Jackie Pullinger just didn't get on the boat and end up, oh, I've got no money left now. She did have a rough time. But she stuck with God's book. And what an incredible ministry. So, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is not in man's name. This is not in the name of your church. This is, you know, the Roman church says it often says, you know, in the name of the church of Rome. But no, it's nothing to do with that. I don't go and share Jesus in Rain's name. As good a fellow as he is. Why? Because it's Jesus' name. I need Jesus with me when I share, not Ray. And that's really being nice, Ray. That's what I said to you. I really don't understand. I do want Ray next to me when I share with people, obviously. But what I'm saying is I'm not depending on him. Why? Because the flesh is weak. My flesh is weak. But the Spirit will raise you up and you can share. He will give you a place to share. Sometimes you'll pray and you'll go somewhere and it doesn't happen the way you think. But don't worry about that. If you've gone in obedience, even if you messed up but really believe it was God saying and you've got most of it right, God does it. I like had someone phone me the other day, and I can't believe something that happened nearly 40 years ago. He shared with me the result of that 40 years later. This was on Thursday. Now, I'm not boasting of me, I'm boasting of the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, 
to encourage you. All right? I have no idea what I did at that moment 20 years ago. But some of you will tell me. And that's amazing, isn't it? And that each of us has got that story in this room. Each of us could have people telling us these things in this. So be encouraged. And I'm nearly there. And behold, I am with you always. Not some days, not every other day, not when you go to church. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And as I said, that end of the world is the end of the Messianic age. It's a different word to the world we use elsewhere. It's the Messianic age. Isn't that amazing? So, going right back to what we've been speaking about from the beginning, the key is, isn't it, where is our hope? You know, where is our hope? Do we have that hope in us in this world? And the other nice thing to end on is this. We are not alone. Now, sometimes you say that we're not alone because Jesus is with us. But actually, he commands us to meet together. Why? Because he understands we need fellowship with one another. He understands the warm embrace of a brother or sister. He can't do that anymore because he's in heaven. And until we go to heaven, until he's come back and gone again, we're not going to see him in that sense. His Holy Spirit is in us, and we know the power of that. But actually, isn't it nice when you meet a brother or sister, and they just give you that hug, or that handshake, or just say, thank you for offering us, or could you help me just pray for me now? That is the Christ church. That is the true church. But actually, first and foremost, it's got to be Jesus. So I want to leave you with that there. Is that, you know, the whole of our lives are based on this wonderful, positive, encouraging hope. And I do thank you in pursuing that song of hope. That really was special. <coughs> yeah, that was wonderful. So, next now we're going to sing another song for us. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less. Thank you. So, I've been not aware of this. I've been happy with that. Use commitment to the battery that flows to the battery. What's happened, sir? We've we got no words. Got no words! No words. It's coming, it's coming. It's in the chorus, because most of you know the chorus. Anyway. Yeah. 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 There we go. There we go. Look at Praise the Lord. There is the power. There is the power. There is the power.
you've been here with us. And that promise of yours to us, Lord, is wonderful. And we thank you now. And I pray now for each and every one of us. And if any of us are wavering slightly, Lord, if there's something that concerns us, that we might turn to another and ask them to pray for us. Lord, I thank you now for the power of prayer. And that you've given us, you've equipped us for this, Lord, by the power of your spirit in us. So, Lord, I pray now for each and every one of us, but also for those who couldn't be of us this morning. We lift them up to you now, Lord, and we do pray, Lord, for their healing, of complete healing, that, Lord, there will be testimony of getting well. Lord, I thank you now that we can be so bold in coming before your throne. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's cheesy coffees out back. I always forget that. It'd be really nice. <laughs>